Well, they're first of all, they're the, uh, as a, they're the second most abundant particle in the uh, universe, in the known universe, uh, the photon being the most abundant. But they're also the smallest um, by many orders of magnitude. They are much smaller than the things that, we would, that would construct us through, really like protons and neutrons. And in fact, they're so small, which makes them very difficult to, to capture and to do measurements on, that in fact, we don't actually know how small that is. We have uh, limits of how small, but we don't know absolutely. And in fact, the, one of the, exp the experiments which I'm working on, part of that experiment is to try and see if we can get a measurement of, of a neutrino, or, or the mass of a neutrino. How do we actually measure the mass of something so small? Well, in this well, that's a very good question. Um, and you look at its production mechanism, which is the one that which we, which all experiments that do this are looking at, which is uh, what we call beta decay, which is a radioactive process, um, where, for example, you have a neutron transforming into a proton inside the nucleus, and one of the product. Well, one, firstly, the main product is a charged lepton, which is an electron or a positron, depending on how you do it and also you get uh, neutrinos coming out, or a neutrino coming out. So you get a neutrino coming out, and then what you then do is you can then work backwards. So you measure the masses of everything else, and then you might then be able to then see what the, what the you know, there's an energy left over, and that would be the, uh, that would be effectively through E equals MC squared, you can then get information about the mass. Now that's not the way we're doing it. We're doing it by different methods, a method called double beta decay, and there we are looking at a particular rare process where bizarrely the, the neutrinos are not produced, which I know sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. But it turns out that there is a, a nice little equation which if you can work out, because it's a radioactive process, if you can work out the half-life of that particular process, then in fact that through the equation, one of the terms in that equation is the mass. So if you can know everything else, and principally the half-life, then you can then infer, again, the mass of the neutrino. Yeah, cool. Where do the neutrinos come from that you are in examining in these experiments? Well, the ones that we, pre the ones we find, well, in all the neutrino experiments that are being conducted today, they're either naturally produced, for example, uh, in the sun. Uh, the sun produces neutrinos all the time because we, the sun works on nuclear fusion. And, it, and that process throws out not only the energy, the, the, the photons, the energy that we receive as heat and light, but also it produces, uh, as a consequence, that also produces millions and millions of, neutri of neutrinos, which pass through us every day. I and mean, we're sitting here now and we are all being bombarded with neutrinos. But it also indicates how, in fact, how small and weakly interacting they are because we don't feel it. You know, we don't feel them, even though there are, well, I say billions. And yet you don't feel it. I mean, I don't. But. What are some of the major detectors that we have around the world for actually look, looking for these things? Right. Okay. Well, the ones that uh, the, may, the, the the ones that have done most of the, the work on things like neutron oscillations are um, ones one in Japan. It's called uh, Super K or Super Cameo Candy, which is a big, large water filled detector. Um, the other one, which is in Canada, which is the Submarine Neutrino Observatory or SNOW for short, although that's actually moving on to other work now because that particular work is, is finished. And that's a feature of all of uh, particle physics is the fact that you can't just throw these things away. They cost a lot of money and we're good at recycling. Um, and then the, the experiment which I'm working on, which I have been working on, which uh, uh, doing double beta decay is uh, in, a, in an underground laboratory in the Frejus road tunnel, which connects uh, southern France over to Italy. It comes out uh, near Torino in, in, in Italy. And the French town on this side of the border is called Madan. In fact, uh, it's called Laboratoire Souterrain de Madan. I'm afraid my French accent's poor, but uh, you get the gist. And you're actually working on something called Super Nemo. What's, what's that and what's it going to do? Yeah, the experiment which we had running was called NEMO, or NEMO 3, because it was just the third version. It, you know, it's something which goes on. You know, we, we built various versions, but we've just literally turned it off and dismantled it. And we're now going to build a new version of it, which we called Super NEMO, simply because it's going to be much bigger. And then we're, it's going to be installed in the same cavity. 
where Nemo 3 was. And in fact, uh, um, I led a team over from University College London, which helped to dismantle it. Uh, the bit that we uh, dealt with was the uh, electronics and also the gas system. It has to have helium gas in it, and um, we produced the gas system. And in fact, we brought them all back to London um, and uh, we've refurbished them. And in fact, the gas system, we have re completely redesigned it and built a new one based on the old one and, um, and, uh, and the electronics, as I say, we're... And also things called photomultiplier tubes, which are very expensive. There are a lot of those in Nemo 3, and we are now recycling those. And we brought 250 of those back, and uh, we're recycling them to use in this new experiment. And um, what, what do you hope Super Nemo will do? Well, what it's, its main focus is determining the a very interesting question about the neutrino, and that is the following, that all the particles that we know to date, and let's take the electron as an example, it has a distinct antiparticle. We call it the positron. And the reason why we know it's distinct is because of its charge, electric charge. Electron is negatively charged, the positron is positively charged. And you can see them quite clearly. And we've produced them. The accelerators that have been around the world that you've seen in places around the world, I worked on one a few years ago. And in fact, the, uh, the, the experiment which was in where the LHC now is, which was then called LEP, was an electron-positron collider. So we used to produce positrons, um, and in fact, you are actually producing positrons right now, by the way, right? because uh, potassium-40, which is an isotope of potassium, which human bodies require, otherwise we don't function, um, one of the isotopes of potassium-40 is decaying through beta decay, but producing positrons. So we are all antimatter producers at some level. So positrons are very clear and distinct. We know a lot about them. The thing about neutrinos are that they don't carry electric charge. So the question is, does it have an anti-neutrino? In other words, does it, is it distinct? And that has not been proven. And in fact, there is evidence to suggest that in fact that's not the case, which would make it totally unique in terms of all the particles that we know of. The 12 particles that make up the standard mother quarks, the what we call the charged leptons, which is electron, muon, tau, and then you've got the three uh, neutrinos. That would mean a quarter of the standard model basically has this unique character, or could have. We, we don't know yet. All right? And we distinguish them by the names of the people who, who brought this whole story together. Uh, Paul Dirac, who was from Bristol and worked at Cambridge University, he was the one who, who first um, uh, talked about, well, not first, but you know, as part of the whole antimatter story. And if you do have distinct antiparticles, then we call them Dirac particles for that reason. And um, the first person to, um, to suggest that maybe the neutrino wasn't of that type was an Italian per, uh, guy called Ettore Majorana. And so if it turns out neutrinos are of that type, then we will call them Majorana particles for in, in his honour. In his honour. Sorry, big pun. And, uh, he is, uh, and it's a bit of a tragic story about Ettore, actually, because he was only about... 32-ish or something like that, and he literally disappeared on a boat journey from Italy to Sicily. He got on the boat at one end and never got off the other end, so the story goes. And uh, so it's a bit tragic. And they've never found his body, so they don't know whether he disappeared or whether he drowned. And to this day, no one knows. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit tragic. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, if, uh, if his name lives on, and in fact, in the acronym for NEMO, um, the E and M in that acronym stands for Ettore Majorana, so we are honouring his name and his uh, thoughts. If we understand neutrinos better, what will that mean? What will that mean? Um, well, from the very basic idea, firstly, we understand, we now understand much better how the sun functions. And in fact, um, we've taken photographs of the sun with neutrinos, and we now know that the sun is actually because the neutrinos are produced right in the middle of the sun. If the sun, for example, wasn't functioning in the middle, it was on its sort of die, it was dying or something, then in fact you wouldn't see that. Um, so that's sort of, sort of fair. But that's not trivial, really, when you consider it, because it means that we understand the sun, and as it's, you know, the giver of life, so to speak, you know, it's something which we need to, you know, we ought to know about. But also, there's a much more basic things, um, because the standard model, um, there are lots of problems with the standard model in the sense that um, um, 
we know there are problems with it. We know that there, there are things that we need to find out. And so therefore, any unique features need to be investigated. And I believe, personally, that uh, is that the neutrino... Um, um, nature has a habit of doing this. It makes the most interesting things the most difficult things to look at. And, uh, and I think the neutrino is going to be one of those. But also, we, you know, there, you know, there's a whole controversy about nuclear fusion, whether we can use that as a power source. Now, it's not directly related, but the point is, is that um, we need to understand these processes much better. And so it's like all science. This is just one part of the jigsaw.